Spinoza is a major figure that which will interest me uh, because uh, he's a pretty crazy philosopher, but also pretty precise. And the combination of, of acumen on the one hand and precision, but also views which are uh, not necessarily common sense and not, not necessarily feeling that they need to adhere to the common prejudices of society in this time or another time, um, is pretty attractive to me. One book is just working is on the political and and, and theological views of Spinoza, or a 17th century philosopher, who was a kind of um, um, a, a kind of the the major heretic of the 17th century, the figure that almost everyone uh, was trying to say, well, if, it, well, let's put it this way. I mean, I think that a very common method of, of um, refutation in the in late, eight, late 17th century and 18th century philosophy was your view leads to Spinozism, therefore you must be wrong. So the idea is, if you are a Spinozist, you are a horrible uh, uh, figure, you are a heretic, whatever, therefore, um, 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 uh, your argument, you, your views must be wrong. And so I, I like this kind of, um, the incarnation of, of heresy in, in Spinoza. Again, I'm, I'm also working on many other issues which interest me, like uh, the history of Palestine in the 19th century, the relationship between Jews and Muslims in the 19th century, um, and the attempt to build a history of philosophy that will be inclusive, so that, for example, medieval philosophy, unlike the way it is traditionally taught in the US, in which it is 99% Christian, uh, should become uh, more um, true, actually. Not, not, I mean, it's not in, it's in the, I mean, I wanted to say inclusive in the sense that it will include medieval Islamic and Jewish philosophy. But um, the thing is that the current way we are now teaching medieval philosophy in the US is the way we are actually doing a racist act in which we are excluding medieval Islamic and, and Jewish philosophy. And it's unlike the case, unlike cases, for example, in which we have a problem of that women in the past were, ex were excluded and we now want to correct that. And that's absolutely justified to make, to try to find a way to address and correct that. But in the case of the exclusion of medieval Islamic and Jewish philosophy, we are the people who are making the exclusion. Because in medieval times, I mean, there were very lively discussions between medieval Jewish and Islamic philosophers. The vast majority of the Jewish residents in, in Palestine were basically Sephardic Jews, Jews who came from North Africa, Middle East, Spain sometimes, um, and um, Turkey, Greece, and places like that. Then there were a few waves of immigration of Jews from Europe who came to Palestine in the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. And, um, and by the end of the 19th century, you had this kind of mixture that would become known as the old Yeshuv. And the interesting thing is that the old, old Yeshuv itself was not enthusiastic about Zionism, I mean, for the most part. They actually loved the way they were living their lives and, and in which they were just having pretty close relationship with uh, their, Muslim, their Muslim neighbors. Again, there would be, it's not, it's not a totally idealistic story, but, but it, uh, there would be occasional fights, there would be, but uh, for the most part, it's a very pleasant story. It's, a, it's important that uh, the study of medieval and early modern Islamic philosophy will become part of the philosophical curriculum. Why it is important? Because it's basically just, um, it's truth. I mean, you know, if, if you can't tell the story of the history of philosophy without Avicenna and Aberus, but it's a distortion. 
And we are doing this kind of dissociation for a long period of time, and I'm sick of that. Mm-hmm.